welcome to uh, the Beyond Linguistics Reading Group presented by Theory Wave Knights. Dirt Son of Earth here. Today we are going to be discussing part three and four. This is our second and final conversation about the Communist Manifesto. We are going to be discussing it through artwork that we produced while reading it. The artwork's going to appear on the right and our little avatars will flash on the left hand side. It's going to be Mike Watson. Mihai Moldova and myself. So enjoy that. We're going to discuss what we got out of the book and why we chose to make the art that we did. And uh, I'm going to go read the Dialectic of Enlightenment for next week and probably brush my beard some more. So enjoy the conversation. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, this is, the title of this is The Details Lost in a Single Image. Um, and it is maybe more actually based on part two than part three and four, even though that's what we read. Um, I found it slightly difficult to make art directly around three and four. Uh, three and four, we have the socialist communist literature and um, the uh, second part, conservative or bourgeois socialism, where Marx kind of goes through and lists the various forms of socialism that he is opposed to um, in the naming of communism. And... While it is all interesting, and some of these have really interesting characteristics, you can maybe even play a fun game uh, to denounce yourself, like go through and be like, all right, which kind of socialist am I that's not true? Uh, am I a reactionary socialist? Am I petty bourgeois? Am I conservative? I think what it kind of got back to me, too, was in part to some of the uh, ambiguity uh, that was in there. Um, Namely, I'm thinking of something specific, but before I get into that, I would like to hear y'all's thoughts on the image. I mean, it's uh, it's an abstract image. It has it's also a collage. No, you have stuck you stuck stuff on it. It is collage, and yes, it's yeah. much more abstract than what I presented for part one, which was basically a, a weird landscape. I mean, it's to me, it's quite typical of your work in that it somehow resembles uh, internet generated imagery so i'm getting a kind of a glitch feel here even though it's actually a painting so i find that interesting that we're looking at a painting yes. online that actually in itself mimics somehow online culture which we've actually spoken about before on, on other shows in relation to your work so i won't kind of take up too much time but just to also touch on it, it being a collage or having collaged elements it's worth bearing in mind that early collage i'm thinking back to uh, people like Picasso, when he started kind of doing collage around his Cubist period, he was very much reflecting the kind of uh, chopped up um, uh, kind of feel of, of industrial life, of, of things not running temp temp temporarily temp in a time sense, things not flowing, you know, like A, B, C or one, two, three, things being kind of disjointed. So this kind of use of collage reflects that, but also it kind of brings art off its pedestal um, to some extent uh, in that you're not looking at, you know, an artwork which is supposed to represent a transcendental reality, which is supposed to kind of take you away from uh, material reality. It's actually taking things like bits of magazines, maybe train tickets, parts of everyday life and sticking them on the surface of the painting, um, which I think in a way is, is a leftist thing to do. And then, of course, Picasso ended up being very active uh, as a communist in later life. Um, so, uh, yeah, just some immediate reflections. Anything you have in mind, uh, Mihai? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I just uh, like the relationship of uh, one of the first things that kind of came to my mind is the relation between colors uh, and uh, the shapes. But, but the... The colors that resulted from uh, the colors and shapes that resulted from the brushwork, and um, this is just um, y you can see this better uh, when you zoom in into the picture. Like you choose particular parts, and you can see better how these things relate to each other. And uh, what it makes me think about is about aesthetics and uh, how 
ambiguous they are and uh, how I believe we don't really know how they work, how aesthetic works, and uh, how this, why some relationship between some uh, objects and uh, some colors, some shapes, why they work. Whereas if you just did slightly differently, like some, some parts, they would feel wrong. And uh, that's kind of the quality of, of art that uh, uh, connects to something um, uh, transcendental, uh, if I say so, which in my opinion, I don't really know exactly why aesthetics uh, work this way uh, and uh, probably will end up um, learning more and uh, studying more with, uh, with Adorno's book about these things. Um, yeah, I mean, we're and, uh, seeing the Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment uh, in two weeks' time um, for a few weeks. I mean, it, these questions of art being transcendental versus, versus materialist are, are kind of quite crucial to left aesthetics. Um, I mean, I think if we're, if we're looking at things from a Marxist perspective, we have to kind of return to the materiality and the fact of things being material and being manipulated by, dare we, shall, shall we dare say, a, a worker, a, a, an artist, somebody who is involved in labor. So I think um, that's kind of a good, a good angle maybe. But sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, just to say something about the fact that it's got these uh, elements of everyday life, uh, as you said, uh, Mike, with the is is it a train ticket, uh, Adam, or, or uh, what's the sunset point station? Ah, yes. Um, so I could see why you would think that is a train ticket. It, it kind of looks like it. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, there is a yeah, like this orange or peaches thing that says Sunset Point Station Priority. There's a barcode. It's pretty smeared up. This is actually a parking pass um, that by a beach near me. I had to print out to park um, at the beach. Uh, and so I put that next to this quote. Um, it is only the social character that is changed. Um, because, yeah, that's like that's something i think that is interesting in the manifesto when he's talking about this some of this like nuance and detail right is that these things change um and everything is embedded with this class and social character uh and when the proletariat takes um its significant role and starts to abolish itself through abolishing class antagonisms, you might still see some of these same things, but the shift is in the very social character that like constitutes them. So to me, that's a, that's an important thing. And it's something that's kind of hard to picture right away. You know, it's something that causes this fuzziness in the brain um, to really picture what that would be. So you know, and that might be the shifting of when beaches became tourist destinations. Um, there's a class character that's changed there. Um, so what would the class character uh, and social character changing of that beach from this tourist destination to something beyond? Like what would these public spaces and beaches look like? in socialism or communism. So that was my idea of pairing those two things uh, directly together. And it is a part of my life. So to incorporate that, yeah, materiality of lived life into it. The social character of, um, of beaches, uh, of, of, of different parts of our life uh, could change as, as a result of uh, a social democratic uh, movement uh, or uh, all, all the different types of um, socialism that Marx kind of criticizes, but it doesn't change materially in, in that it's still... Uh, where, where would you use so, social character and material character interchangeably? It can, all, it can also be like that, couldn't it? Right. I do think that's, yeah, that's a complicated thing. And that speaks to some of the nuance I think there actually is in the manifesto. Because from my understanding of Marx, and it doesn't come directly from this book, but 
it's hard to parse that difference between um, a social relation uh, and materialism. You know, like the human mm-hmm. social relations are part of the material. Um, and, you know, later people would argue maybe that a very important part in and of itself. Um, so, I, and I kind of side with that. Mm-hmm. That that's the way a lot of this makes sense to me is to think of like economics being just a reification of uh, human social relations. So the social character of something is pretty important for when discussing the the material reality of it. Like it, it's almost like what you need to fully understand the material. It works very much on a surface level. I think having the, the kind of ink, I guess it's simple pen though. Uh, yeah, it is pen. Writing on top of the, the painting, it, it kind of, it destroys the illusion of depth. Okay, so you're looking now at just a piece of board or, or canvas. I'm not sure what, what your medium is, what your base is. Um, but there's no longer that potential for imagining your, your way into a different reality. You're, you're, you're thrown into your own reality, uh, looking at a, a material thing that's been made by a person. And I think this is very much in line with a kind of progression that happened through modernism was to kind of like rid the artwork of its illusory value so it became uh, just material. Um, and in painting, this functions in a similar way to to installation pieces, to ready-made, to, you know, the, the idea that you, you can just take an object and put it in a museum. I think abstract painting had a similar tendency that it is a painting, there, but it's still effectively a thing that's made in a world of kind of negative social relations. And I think what's interesting, I think, in, in part three of the of the manifesto is when Marx is talking about these kind of uh, faulty communists, these these kind of unreal or inadequate communists. He goes through, I think, four different types. And these people who, you know, they they want the communism, that they're not prepared to change the entire relations of production and and ownership. And I think we see this in art a lot. that you know, one can make something that looks communist. One can make something that that is no longer transcendental and somehow re- related to the church or to kings or rich people who commission artworks. But as long as it enters into a system of exchange that is capitalist, it's fundamentally capitalist. It's it's not changing anything. So then you get to the the, the thing of okay, well, Adams painted a picture that fundamentally resists transcendental kind of romantic bourgeois values. But if it entered into the gallery circuit, it would, again, be capitalist. And then that depends on how Adam decides to exchange this work, or maybe he doesn't exchange it. Maybe he just puts it on YouTube, like we're going to put this talk on YouTube. Now it's on Twitch. But then even then it enters into the capitalist relations. So, I mean, this gets kind of complicated, and we can't expect Adam to solve this problem. But it's just interesting. I think that's one thing that stood out for me, uh, Marx's accusation against the um, conservative bourgeois communists is one that very much applies to political art and, and, and contemporary art in general and the art world. But yeah, I mean, do we have, we're going to talk further on this work. Do you have any kind of comments, things you wanted to say in particular, Adam? Um, I, well, yeah, a, a couple short things. Um, well, first, the, my favorite thing from the, the conservative or bourgeois socialism was they desire the existing state of society minus its revolutionary and disintegrating elements. They wish for a bourgeois without a proletariat. Uh, so wishing for a bourgeois without a proletariat does seem quite in line with what you were saying about um, the modern art world or contemporary art world. Um, that to me is exactly what's happening. The, the, yeah. Um, I mean, it is kind of third wave politics. There's even a bit of Thatcherite. Um, this kind of trickle down effect that you can make the wealth happen and it somehow will kind of filter down to the poor people and they they will take on your values and we all become eventually middle class. And that's very much kind of how politics has operated for the last few decades and where we seem to be heading again um, in the sense that we had this kind of moment of hope that Corbyn could become prime minister in the UK, that Sanders could become president. Now they're not going to be, and we're kind of thrown back on these other options, uh, Biden and Starmer, uh, neither of which seem particularly radical. Um, so we kind of inhabit this space again, unfortunately. 
and it's, it's something that's very hard to deal with because of course do you then as i've been discussing on on twitter with some people uh yesterday uh do you then kind of withdraw your support from from biden and starmer and in the case of biden therefore let trump become president uh as a kind of protest against the whole kind of rotten charade um the whole rotten system uh and actually this was kind of answered for me today reading through again the fourth part of the communist manifesto um i just need to return to it now to remember the exact context and it's basically um what is that section called again the um, conservative or bourgeois socialism uh, the actual whole fourth part is position position as a communist in relation to the various existing opposition parties that is part four no yeah yes yeah um so basically then he says uh marx says um that you know we we will work with certain bourgeois parties and he mentions the french uh in france the communist ally with the social democrats um so you don't get this kind of outright um refusal to work with with the center left they say it can work where it's needed these alliances can be necessary and helpful towards the struggle basically paraphrasing but then in the end they're very clear that the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims they openly declare that their that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions so there's there's this kind of in in the space of a few sentences is from the yeah, okay work with bidden if you have to uh work with starmer if you have to but we're not going to conceal our real aims and we're ultimately there to overthrow basically them so if i if i can add this seems to be like the theme that is coming uh over and over in the third part and fourth part and uh really in the first two as well the the necessary uh, uh, overthrow of exist- existing social conditions so it's not just an improvement of conditions not just uh, kind of superficial uh, yeah but uh, the, the, yeah. sorry the, the, the modifier here is that yes this is what we want um but if one has to work with the the center left then then we should do then of course one wonders what the center left are thinking because it's not like the center left weren't aware that this book existed and certainly not certainly now they're aware um so from the center left point of view communists are saying yeah we'll we'll work with you but we'll also try and depose you get rid of you um and anything when actually the center left they're kind of the same in reverse because they do kind of say well okay let's work with the far left for votes etc but ultimately we're going to neutralize them and not let them ever have power so they're both playing the same game yeah cuz i mean and in this it's not even that they're saying well you can or maybe you should it's almost like you have to work with these other groups that like i don't know the way it read to me was um kind of like they're saying the communists are outside of all of that and they're kind of like pushing it along like they're going to find the the people doing that are most in each particular society or nation they're kind of finding who has their who has the ability to push things the furthest and getting behind them no but then yeah like you were saying but then knowing as soon as they get their things they're going to have to turn it against them um yeah yeah i mean it's a tough uh, it's a tough call with um what's happening today i mean i just can't see in the case of america i can't see how one could deny that it's really fundamental to get rid of trump even if like okay we go back to bidden but you know if you don't do that if you don't return to that you basically embolden trump and you know he becomes even more dangerous than he is at least if you change president you kind of upset the flow of things temporarily well, i don't know what you think adam because you're actually voting in america i'm not uh yeah true um i am going to have a very hard time voting for biden it, i don't know it depends on what's going on but i've always been kind of uh one of those types of voters i i like voting and i have voted for many people who have had no chance of winning um it's a tough question uh really we could get into tons and tons of stuff of that um without getting too deep into it i do worry 
about the dissatisfaction that will come from a Biden presidency, although it most definitely will be easier on some populations. And it speaks to a certain privilege I have to not think about some of that stuff. Yet in the long run, I see it being potentially worse um, as you know, people think, well, okay, now we have Biden and everything's going to be okay. Um, Trump was an aberration when in, you know, many ways Trump is, besides his crudeness, is not much of an aberration from American politics as it is. So, you know, they'll look for something further after that. Um, just like the the case of people voting for Obama twice and then going to Trump um, because they're dissatisfied. I don't want to get too much further into that or turn this into a debate about electoral politics. Sure, yeah. Because there is more in this book than that. I mean, it clearly does touch on some of that, but there is also more. Um, you could think of this with other people too. Like we could kind of think of this about working with anarchist groups, with working with uh, Greens, with working with the various socialist parties that are in... Um, yeah. Europe and some in America. I mean, Marx became most opposed to working with anarchists. True. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Later on, and I don't remember the date. It was it's in the 1870s when he evicted, um, expelled uh, Bakunin from the Communist International. Uh, but it's right. going away from the, the current reading again. Um, but let, let's go on to Mihai's work, and this can maybe get, get us back onto the manifesto. Yeah. So, Mihai, we now have up your the full view of your work on screen. So if you could just describe to us what we're looking at. Okay. Um, I can start either by, by describing the actual elements I used or by talking a bit uh, about the inspiration uh, that I got from the book. Uh, let's, in this case, let's go straight to the book and then talk about the, the work formally. Uh, in this chapter, Marx uh, makes a distinction between the versions of socialism and communism that want to alter existing society without changing the social conditions. So uh, he's constantly going back to the same point and it seems like all all this whole book is 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 uh, a constant bring bringing on of the same point of the necessity to change the social conditions and the importance of the working class uh, uh, in in uh, changing these conditions um, and uh, by social conditions i mean uh, wage labor or uh, capitalism accumulation of capital uh, another way to put it. So a break from these conditions will bring a new stage in human civilization, as different from our current stage as is the industrial capitalist society from a monarchic or feudal state. So it is self-evident that a uh, further development of society is going to have a more advanced industry with more advanced cybernetics. So I was trying to imagine, uh, okay, so we've we've managed to change the social conditions, we've managed to abolish capitalism what uh, for sure the, after this stage there's going to come a new more advanced stage and it's going to rely more and more on um, uh, on cybernetics uh, on uh, more advanced uh, mode of uh, or more advanced uh, industrial production so i i try to use some of these elements you know, some of these shapes that are um, Free, these 3D shapes uh, that have a more kind of otherworldly appearance, uh, which is kind of what I imagine is going to be the world of these autonomous AI algorithms that uh, are going to direct production and uh, and control uh, in a good way versus say most of our life. Uh, so. Um, all this capital that is hoarded by the industrial bourgeois will be used to benefit the workers by automation of labor and the revolution of everyday life. Uh, this will free society from its stagnation, opening the door for a future to come in. So that, with that, we can kind of segue into my meme. This is what, what I made in response to reading the, the manifesto, Duma and Duma Girl. So Duma is a figure that appeared a few years ago on a Chan message board, uh, basically a nihilist, but I think right-leaning originally, sometimes now is associated with issues. Recently uh, there emerged a Duma girl and normally they're not getting on particularly well so he's saying something that she's kind of just uninterested or vice versa and I've basically used one format where you normally have 
the two of them talking with this this kind of comic uh, layout. Uh, and I had had basically her say to him, "Hey, do you want to watch some Marx docs?" And then you see them watching the TV together, and the kind of the the drink can because there's a drink can there anyway. Normally, I've kind of replaced it uh, with one which is a play on Doctor Pepper, and it says Doctor Radical. Um, I love that. Basically, in the first scene, it's actually an image I got from Terry Tapp, a uh, writer and an occasional or, well, a permanent co-host of Theory Wave Nights, who will be joining us again, I think, for a Dialectic of Enlightenment reading in a couple of weeks. I saw this on his page, this kind of background image. It says the Dow's best week since 1938. I don't know if this is actually a true image. I guess it might be because the Dow... I believe it is. It rose very quickly when, when uh, Bernie Sanders dropped out. Um, of the democratic race. At the bottom, it says more than 16 million Americans have lost jobs in three weeks. So it's this kind of tone deafness of the news networks. Um, and I mean, I just like the idea of like these people getting together and maybe they're both doomers, i.e. I, both nihilists. But at some point, seeing the crap we're going through, even the kind of most hardened Zuma uh, nihilist um, might be convinced to watch the Marx documentaries. I don't actually know very many inter- really good ones. There ought to be more but to do that or to read together um, through reading groups and the such like and it's by doing that that people develop a consciousness they get together and then they get their friends into it etc etc so I mean there's some hope I think that this could happen that that, uh, the conditions are there we're really kind of in trouble I mean many accounts are saying that the coming recession depression will be bigger than anything we've seen before which would suggest ensuing um, social strife warfare etc um, and we have this thing called the internet, which we didn't have during the Great Depression of 1929 onwards, or the crisis. To, well, we did have it in the crisis, excuse me, but we 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 have it now, and it's in greater use now than ever before. We have a strong left wing presence online, and we can use that to try and spread consciousness, uh, both for now and when uh, we get out of our lockdowns. I wanted to say. I really like this meme that you made and how wholesome it is. Um, it's really, that's an interesting part. I think it kind of reflects what you took away, what you were saying about um, the fourth part. It's like there is a possibility uh, to get together. You know, so many of the Doomer and the Doomer Girl memes are are about this impossibility of these people. They The Doomer is tries to hit on the Doomer Girl and... The Doomer Girl, you know, says usually almost always something negative back to him and he's left alone. Um, and in this one, she approaches him and, you know, they they end up together or whatever. That's this happy, happy thing at the end. Um, but it's that ability like, hey, we can come together, which is like what that fourth part is saying, like the communists will look through um, the radical potentials and we will align with what we can. I mean, to be coming in. I can see your point largely, um, although it is a very cis uh, orientated uh, heterosexual representation, and actually a number of representations have a uh, Duma girl going off with another meme character who's a woman. Um, so Often with a trad wife. It, it depends. I, I think of the one where she goes off with um, a blonde haired girl in a like blue kind of old fashioned yeah, dress, which is girl, often yeah. seen as like, yeah, trad girl or from the right male perspective, the trad wife, because that's what they that's like the object of desire for, you know, that ideological. Um, OK, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, why kind of been thinking of uh, as Marx talked about this, um these different groups of socialists that weren't really socialists. Um, and he talks about these kind of conservative bourgeois communists and how they want little kind of tweaks and changes, but they don't want a proper revolution. And uh, I've already said that that made me think of the art world. Uh, it made me think also of Walter Benjamin's author as producer, an essay he wrote in 1934, um, where he talks about, he talks about like a certain type of, of writer who, a certain type of journalist who uh, uses their position uh, perhaps on a newspaper uh, for their own gain, that there's a kind of projection of left-wing values, and maybe they even are left-wing, but as long as they're kind of cosy in their position, they're not really expressing uh, kind of left-wing economic relations. And I'm just thinking about um, the left internet and left Twitter and left tube and how we can all kind of... uh, 
deal better with our influence or lack of influence, as it possibly is. Uh, um, you know, the, the tendency, of course, is naturally to try and pursue your own success and fame. I don't think you even need to be someone particularly power hungry to do that. You, you just, as a human being, much as an animal, you're you're looking for financial security, food stability, uh, a partner, etc. Um, but this is very hard doing this to avoid uh, the kind of conflicts that lead you down roads um, that are not really communist in spirit. And yeah, I just wanted to reflect on that. Uh, I don't think we can really solve that, but just um, you know, I I, th- I think there needs to be there need to be certainly in the publishing industry and the arts new new ways of doing things, new new relations where where everyone basically is equal from the offset. And then you have to be very careful if you're going to make a new publishing house, a new website, a new whatever. I mean, how do you apportion? Um, how do you how do you apportion um, profit or ownership of this thing from the beginning to make sure everyone's getting getting kind of the, the same out of it? I don't know if anyone has any kind of similar reflections. Can I read a passage that relates to what you're saying from the book? Please. Historical action is to yield to their personal inventive action, historically created conditions of emancipation to fantastic ones, and the gradual, spontaneous class organization of the proletariat to the organization of society specifically contrived by these inventors. Future history resolves itself in their eyes into propaganda and the practical carrying out of their social plans. So kind of relates to what you're saying. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely what what I was thinking of. I think that relates to what Mike was saying about uh about how this can be seen through the art world. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to that because I've just found now the direct quote I was looking for from from Benjamin from the author as producer, and he says, "Before I ask, how does literary work stand in relation to the relationships of production in a period? I would like to ask, how does it stand in them?" So that could be a confusing quote, but basically, uh, before I ask how a work, should we say an artwork, stands in relation to the relationships of production in a given period, I'd like to, I'd like to understand how, how it situates itself actually, you know, politically, uh, socially, uh, economically. And I, and I think, um, you know, what, what he's really saying is, because he's talking about journalists, he's trying to throw it on the journalists, that it's not so much... You know, what's the work about? How does it stand in relation to society? What's it saying about society? It's more like, you know, um, what's, expre- what's it expressing about society in terms of the, the, the relations of production inherent to the to writing itself? Like the writer, how were they when they wrote it? If they were writing about marginalised communities, how do they approach those marginalised communities? How do they deal with their boss? Did they like take certain stances to please their boss rather than to further, you know, a, a, a communist society or socialist society? I mean, I think the pressures on people are enormous. I don't think they, that that's one thing that I think can, I can really relate to. Um, um, even if Benjamin's writing in 1934, I mean, we could say with the Communist Manifesto, obviously written a long, a, a long time before that, 1848, I think, 1848, um, that, um, you know, there's certain parts of the manifesto I can't entirely relate to. I understand what's being said, but I don't see how they relate to this society or map onto our current situation ec- economically, um, although a lot of it does. But with this, I can just see like, okay, you're a writer, um, you want to do the right thing, but you want to get ahead. You you, you you have certain pressures from your, your boss on a magazine. Um, you want to write about things, but you don't want to get, you, you can't get that involved. Um, much art about immigrants, and there's people writing about art about immigrants. Are they going and talking to the immigrants? Probably not likely. It's very rare that people are talking to immigrants fresh off ships about what they think uh, rather than about the artist who made a piece about these immigrants. But, you know, people want to skip all that bit because they have a deadline and they want to make 150 euros, $150 for a review or whatever 
often much less. Um, I mean, also online, you can get yourself in these positions. You want to get out a video. You want to get out a meme. Does it seem exactly right what you're doing? Are you going to upset somebody? You know, do you make a, a podcast about someone else's awful podcast with a bad take, which is going to probably upset them? You know, but can you not? Can you can you avoid doing that? Because that's how you get ahead. And that, you know, the whole thing's incredibly bitchy, um, how things work mm-hmm. on the online left in that respect, that we all get ahead by kind of cussing each other out. Um, but how can we expect to kind of foster a left if we're all treading on each other? And But then is that even not left? Because if you're looking at the task of making revolution happen, there's going to have to be a certain amount of treading on people on the way perhaps to give, give them realities. Um, and of course, Marx, when he kicked, he kicked Bakunin out of the Communist International, that was treading on somebody to, to kind of further one's own position, I would think. I don't think it was purely theoretical. Um, so there's a few questions on how, how we should approach things. Yeah, that actually makes me think of uh, something that just the these parts that we read this week, um, three and four, the whole book kind of fits this, but especially three and four, how biting it is. Like it, I mean, Marx, Marx's writing is like this in other places too, but it, it's, I don't know, you can tell, he's a good writer. It's funny, um, but it's reads so catty. Like when yeah, he's yeah. talking about describing them, like he's like, you know, if it was written today, it'd be like, and these people are dumb as fuck. Um, maybe they stumbled across something good, but who doesn't when they're sucking their own thumb? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's just so rude. Um, I, it is quite infighting at some point. Can I say like when, when I read the book, uh, first, when the idea came to me and like the communist manifesto seems like an extremely long 19th century diss track, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because he's like, and we're the best. We're going to do this. We always hold these things in favor. We are the ones giving the truth. Like, it, it is kind of like a diss track. I, I see it. And a yeah. brag track but at the same time. It is an explosive polemic uh, kind of text that doesn't appear to to point to any kind of solutions in a way. I mean, and it didn't ultimately provide solutions but then of course it's a complex world and nobody has really solved the inequality but i mean you even in reading it ignoring the history we know you go well, this is like a really just like you know angry young man text that is going to achieve about as much as rappers cussing each other out or uh, people making memes uh, attacking each other um i mean this is I, I guess Marx matured, and then you get the, the das, das Kapital, Capital, which is a, obviously a huge, much longer book and addressing a completely different kind of angle or taking a completely different angle where he's gone, okay, we, we're we not going to get anywhere by cussing each other, people out. Although he does cuss people out in that book as well, but we need a methodical, slow approach. And then you read that and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, is it how many more pages is, is he going to talk about the cost of linen? Um, and then, but then there are all these gems. You're going to get through those pages. You get kind of quite interesting imagery and, and metaphors and things. Um, but I mean, the manifesto, I think, is a very interesting document. I'm glad we've, we've read it, um, partly because it is so angry and it kind of gives us something to, to get our teeth into. Um, yeah, and yeah, some of that, some of that anger and that brag and that diss is really works for it. Um, absolutely. And you know, it helps drive home this theme that he mentioned several times, basically like, no, don't hide your goals and aims. Like the communists should be open about what, what the goal is. Um, which is funny because now, you know, everyone in t- today's like mainstream political discourse, communists are supposedly like secret plotters, you know, like all the Democrats are secret secret communists trying to have these conspiracies in the eyes of like the the right-wing mind which you know he's straight up saying please don't do that no we will will always scream loud who we are and then ends with working men of all countries unite like that it works it really works uh that tone does for that last that last part of especially is different from how uh, a lot of theory today is written. It's uh, very careful and uh, very boring sometimes. Um, it's like the opposite of a dog whistle, in a way. You know, <laughs> if a dog, sorry, I had to interrupt me. me I, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, no. The, the, the dog whistle is like the silent whistle you do, and only your other kind of far out uh, extremists can understand. This is just like walking straight in there and saying, fuck it, let's do it. Um, really loudly which is <laughs> kind of similar but i just want to come back as well and i mean 
uh, the question that uh, Mike you said that uh, if what is how do we tread uh, in the future? I mean, do we uh, become uh, more con- contrarian, uh, or uh, I mean, do do we change like the the way in which we, we organize and 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 try and, and bring uh, the way we organize ourselves and we all these institutions are organized so we kind of try and I think bring the change that we want uh, before we do the kind of revolution which Marx was talking about if you if you understand what I mean uh, he because I think he talks over and over and says that we first need to concentrate kind of on the revolution and and then changing the the material conditions, the the, the bourgeois society. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's tricky that because I think yeah. that as long as you wait that for that to happen, maybe it will never happen. And if you're someone who honestly believes in the notion of um, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, which I don't remember which text it's from now. I don't think it comes into the Communist Manifesto. I think it might be from the Gotha program. Um, but it's a very simple kind of um, framework, you know. Um, it probably exists in, it does certainly exist in many religions, but basically we all, we all help each other out. Do it do as to others as you want done, done to yourself, this kind of thing. Uh, if you believe in that, then why wouldn't you be doing it in your daily, daily working relations? And how can mm-hmm. you kind of make an art entity uh, organization, foundation, museum, gallery, whatever, if you're not uh, basically approaching it with that very spirit? I mean, how, how can you claim to be promoting that spirit if you're not employing that spirit? So I don't, I don't think it's the case that we, we, we do whatever we can to force revolution to then implement those conditions. I don't really think you're worthy of the moniker leftist if you're not first thinking about having everything in order in your, in your daily working uh, relations. But don't those conditions come out of the, the this uh, inequality and of the yeah, materiality in the way of, of capitalism? I mean, uh, if people honestly feel like, oh, I'm poor in a capitalist society or relatively poor, and so I need to fuck off all, I need to fuck over all of my uh, um, accomplices or artistic colleagues so I can get ahead. If they think that because society is making them like that and they're desperately trying to change society so they can suddenly be nice again or it would be nice for the first time ever. Um, you know, that to me just sounds very odd and they're not anyone I recognise as, um, as a comrade. But then this is, it's, you, it's everywhere, it's rife. I mean, uh, and, I, and, you know, it's not even point to name names because it's just what's going on. Uh, well, personally, I think like, you establish a kind of... Uh, a uh, more or less flat hierarchy uh, within uh, a bigger organization with a lot of people. So you, you, you're going to have, and what's the, uh, Marx also talks about in the Communist Manifesto that this idea of having a flat hierarchy is a utopian uh, idea. I mean, that you're not, you're not even like, and I've heard this before, even after the revolution or after the uh, change of the uh, economy, like you, you're still going to have hierarchies. And uh, I don't know. I, I know what you mean, but uh, also if you concentrate too much on this, then it becomes a bit like uh, walk politics, or uh, you're concerned too much about saying the right thing, or or, or uh, Maybe seeming not. nice. Well, yeah, but nice is one thing, but giving people their dues is something else. I mean, and by that I mean giving people the credit they deserve is is different. I mean, that's not to me really woke politics. I mean, it could intersect, but um, mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I just don't see how you can present something as something else. I don't think how, how you can go. I mean, in, in no other field of life are you going to go. Well, actually, people do do it, but you say, I, I, I'm all up for this, but you're actually doing the opposite. I mean, that is hypocrisy in any in any other field. You're not, you're not doing the opposite. You, I mean. Like you, you, you're part of a bigger organization. I don't know that is has this kind of uh, hierarchies in it. Some people do want power. Some people don't want power. But and, and of course, yeah, hierarchies exist. Somebody is more stronger than someone else. Someone is more intelligent. Someone, you know, there's always going to be upper upper hands. You can't have a non-hierarchical football game, for example. I mean, there's going to be winners and losers. But within that, you can still mitigate against uh, unfairness. Um, I agree. With that. Still promote against prima donnas. You know, so I mean, okay, you say they exist, but the fact that they exist doesn't mean they should they should um, 
dominate the leftist movement or leftist art institutions or art institutions that display leftist works. Um, yes, I don't agree with prima donnas, but um, maybe I mean Marx would have been a, a good uh, leader at the point. And but he I mean, he was, but um, had we gone down the anarchist route, and and this was a subtle anarchism that appreciated you needed structures, but they, they were just kind of decentered. I mean, the idea that anarchism is absolutely legalist anyway is a, is a um, misunderstanding of anarchism. Not that I'm saying you're misunderstanding, but I'm saying the colloquial understanding is not really accurate. I mean, there were even anarchists in some in some European parliaments in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, it's basically devolution, decentralization. And uh, I might be all, I mean, if you look at now at what's happening in the kind of decentered state, but state remaining only really to protect business interests if the left had an opposite if the left had like a, an anarchist movement that was strong it could kind of co-opt that and say okay well you can have your decentered state and we'll just have our decentered left state or we'll just move in and kind of grow up in the hollowed out state uh, 